So Robin, tell me about yourself. Your current patient, correct? Yes. Yeah. And um, what have you seen before? Uh, actually, I wasn't current. I just first. Um, okay. But it was for my lower back. Okay. And then I took Good. Okay. And you want the... Were you the... feeling better? Or you want I things? was feeling better. Feeling better. But I... I got this email. I wanted to learn more information. Good. Um, you know, and then, um, thinking about that preferred um, you know, uh, wellness. Wellness. Um, fitness yeah. That, yeah. Nick, you can put re put your slides back up if you want to. Okay. Because it'll just be running in the background and just so you know this is kind of like where your review. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so these are going. Yeah. So yeah. And I go so, yeah, I'll just be like that. It's going in the background. Yeah. Okay, cool. Microphone wise, we'll be okay. Um, I think you should speak louder than you think you should. Yeah. I'll, because I'll, this mic is good, but it's kind of I'll scream it's not in, recognizing it. Yeah, I'll scream in the computer. How's that? <laughs> hey, will you take this? So the slides will show on the uh, on the thing. I don't think it will. But if I angle it to the TV, then maybe that will yeah. help. Probably. We're trying a new feature in YouTube. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Because I want you to still be able to like talk to your audience. Right. Right. Present. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well, welcome. We'll get started. Um, I'm a little bit raspy last night. I was telling some of the earlier ones. I have my four boys. I'll show you this next photo. We'll just get started here. Today's the whole purpose of today's presentation is to help you understand the importance of core strength, how it relates to low back pain, but also hip pain. We get so much confusion around, is it my hip or is it my back? And then why does core strength matter? And there's a few fundamentals. I call them the five fundamentals of core strength that uh, is really the purpose or topic of this presentation. So um, very open dialogue, obviously. So anytime you have questions, don't feel like you can't interrupt or like, hey, can you clarify? Not a problem at all. I intend this to go uh, for almost an hour, maybe a little bit closer um, to the hour mark since we're starting a little bit later now. But uh, feel free to ask questions. There'll be plenty of time for that, OK? Uh, some of you know me. Some of you may not. My name is Dr. Nick Hunter. Uh, this is my place. Many of you know my providers here, a fabulous team. They, all of them have been with me for a number of years now. All of them have been with me since they were students. And it's been a fantastic uh, kind of testament to, to them and what they're wanting to do, how similar it is to what I'm wanting to do. And it's, it's just great to work in a team environment where we all have the same agenda, the same intention behind getting better ourselves as clinicians, uh, but then also treating as a team and being humble enough to know that we're going to work collaboratively as a group, as a team, to make sure that each patient is getting what they need versus feeling like it's my own agenda, my own bias that I'm injecting into their care. We all work very collaboratively as a team, which is why many of you have been patients before, you know how it works, where you're gonna come in, you're gonna see multiple providers, uh, and then every Thursday we get together as a team to go over patient cases, who is progressing, who is not progressing, what do they need, what's going on, and we work together and, and then we practice techniques and such. So I very, feel very grateful to work with that team. I've got over 10 years experience, host a Healthy Lifestyles podcast. We do a hyper-local podcast. Any of you podcast listeners like it at all? I love it because I get the chance to meet a lot of great providers in the area, whether that's spine um, spine specialists, nutritionists, fitness experts, um, and all of them are local here. The farthest I've been out is Scottsdale. There's a, a great cardiovascular uh, cardiology group that I interviewed on the podcast. It's, just, it's a phenomenal model of care, more from a preventive side than – a reactionary or treatment side. So I was really excited for that episode. Uh, I'm, my, wife Je my wife, Jessica, and my four boys in this photo here, you can see uh, Jessica's a, a, a co-owner. Uh, obviously, she used to do a whole lot more in the business. Now she, she just started real estate during COVID, actually. She's always kind of wanted to get into that, and we were a, a lot more stable here and didn't need her as much, though I, I still feel like we, we need her here because she does a whole lot of, of behind-the-scenes work that uh, you, you don't quite realize. <laughs> But she's she's great and she's happy with what she's doing now. And, and then my four boys. Uh, he's my oldest here on the on the right side. He's 
he's been in here before. Gary's seen him in here, um, but he's six foot four. I, I intentionally chose this photo so it looks like I'm taller and you know, we're all sitting down, but he's, he's much taller than me. And my other one, the, the blonde haired uh, side, he's, he's 15. He's almost exactly my same height right now. So, and then my third, he's actually, he's at baseball games right now. They didn't announce the schedule until earlier this week. So I had to miss. Um, but, so why you're here, like we have already had a chance to talk about before, have a history or curiosity around back pain, either I have had it or know people who have, the challenges that treating back pain presents, a lot of the buzzwords around core strength, what is core strength, is it more than just crunches or ab work, what exactly is it, and one of the purposes that I'm here today is just to help clarify, what is core strength, what does it mean, how do you do it correctly, and why is it so important? Additionally, uh, we all know the challenges around treating back pain, and some of the folks feel like the need to get more aggressive in treatment uh, and feel they may be pigeonholed or have waited too long to where now their only options are pills, surgery, or injections. And the uh, reason why I want to do something like this is because so many folks don't realize how important early intervention is and how much progress and improvement can be made in your spine condition, in your spinal injury case, if you are early into care and getting treated appropriately, where you don't feel like, oh, my case is so bad, my only option is surgery, when it's just, it's just not the case, especially when we look at the numbers with what spinal surgery is producing, spinal injections causes, and of course the opioid epidemic. And that's gonna go into my next, um, my next topic is, uh, this, we kind of already gone over this one, who is this perfect for? Is this perfect for people like you guys who are curious about wanting to know more about the core, what they can do, and then what to do next? This is what we're going to go over is why is it so important and what to do next. Um, this is the truth about back pain. So the scary reality is 80% of the population is going to have some level of back pain in their life. A lot of it will go away just as spontaneously as it came on. The typical prescription is rest and take some over-the-counter pills. That if you go to the doctor with low back pain complaints and there's no like trauma or anything like that, that's typically the prescription. In fact, only 7% of, of patients who go to their primary care complaining of low back pain will be given a referral for physical therapy. It is a study, study uh, with uh, Julie Fritz, a former professor of mine at University of Utah. She's a, one of the pioneering uh, physical therapy clinici clinical researchers on low back pain. And one of her studies demonstrated how often patients go to primary care with complaints of low back pain and how often is a referral for physical therapy given? Only 7% of the time. So 93% of the time, it's a referral for rest and take pain pills and then come back in, in four to six weeks if it persists. And so very, very large population of people will have back pain. Currently, at any one time, 26 million people have low back pain. And the typical flow of patient journey from back pain usually goes rest and pain pills to opioids. So it's a stronger pain pill. The over-the-counter stuff didn't work. Here's a stronger pain pill to then, oh, that didn't work. Then injections come in next. Injections are a corticosteroid. So it's a strong anti-inflammatory. And they usually do a cocktail of three medications in that injection. And when you hear about epidural, you're, you're thinking about they are actually piercing through the disc into the area where the nerve is and bathing it with this, with this injection. And it's usually um, a strong steroid anti-inflammatory called a corticosteroid. And then a, a bupivacaine or lidocaine combination, which is a slow-acting but longer-lasting pain-relieving agent. And then they have a fast-acting but, but short-lasting pain-relieving agent to try and get you some relief right away. Now those by themselves, they don't burn any bridges. It's not horrible. It doesn't change the anatomy of your spine. It's not as though those really do any damage per se in isolation. The danger is through repeated use, corticosteroids have a long, long researched history of the damages they do to connective tissue, like ligaments, even to bone, but then also to blood sugars. And so if you talk to any any orthopedic provider or spine surgeon, they're only going to do two to three, maybe four in a year. And then they're going to be like, hey, this, we can't do any more. Otherwise, we run the risk of really putting you at risk. 
for uh, tears of, of tissue, bone de deterioration, even joint deterioration, because the joint surfaces of bone are a, a very unique complex cartilage or different surface. When you hear about bone on bone, we hear it mostly in knees. When you hear about bone on bone, that cartilage surface has been worn down and is gone, and now we have very tender bone crushing on tender bone. Repeated use of corticosteroid injections wear that down faster. They accelerate that degradation or that decline and make it so it's it, um, you really your only, your only option is, is surgery and usually joint replacement. So when they do that in the spine, they still be very, very cautious because they don't have replacement options. Instead, they'll fuse it. So now there's, it's no longer a joint. It's now just a fixed structure, uh, which has its own, own problems. But as you see, surgery, again, is an attempt to fix. The results are only about 50-50. That's what's so scary is when we go into our last ditch effort to get some relief, we're only half. We're only the best case scenario is it's either going to get a little bit better, half the folks get a little bit better, half the folks get no better or worse. And so it is kind of a frightening uh, situation to be in, especially if we're looking at it in our early 40s, uh, early 50s. From that standpoint, it's a different story when we're late 60s, early 70s, getting a spine fusion. Those folks do actually pretty good. But when we get earlier on, it's a much, much tougher uh, situation to overcome. Uh, going back over opioids and injections, one of the biggest issues I see, and one of the reasons why I combat those treatments as much as possible, as early as possible, because ultimately they only end up masking the problem. Why is your back breaking down that you have pain? Why is it doing it routinely? And so many folks just chalk it up to, oh, it's because of genetics, or it's because I used to work doing whatever, usually mechanics or did, did a lot of heavy lifting or heavy operating machinery. They'll chalk it up to, oh, I did all these things and I didn't take care of myself. It's like, well, okay, but we're meant to bend, lift, and twist. And it's not exclusive to those groups of people that have these issues. It's moms who are working a lot. It's people who are sitting a lot, people who are standing a lot. It's people who do all kinds of activities that are still having these kind of similar breakdowns to their spine. And so it's not just so easy to say, oh, it's because of this activity or it's because of my genetics. When what we're finding more and more, it's movement patterns, it's muscle synergy, it's strength coordination. It's a lot of things that go into that spine treatment that attack the root cause of the situation versus just the, the site of the pain. And that's what we're noticing more and more in our research in attempting to combat the complexities of low back pain because we often think, oh, it's just this site, it's just this, it's this disc that's irritated, or it's this nerve, it's bothersome. When the reality is, if it were just that simple, then injections would be great because we'd go in there, kill that pain, get out and be like, all right, all fixed. Only to find out six weeks later to six months later, it's come right back. Why is that? Because we didn't get to the root cause of it. And the root cause is much more complex than just saying this little area is hot and we want to cool it down. It's why is it continuing to get hot? Why does it continue to break down? The breakdown is a symptom. It's not the root cause. And when we look at opioids and injections and even surgery, we're looking at only really attacking the symptom, even though it looks like it's root cause when it's not. Any questions about that? Ultimately, our goal in physical therapy and what we try and preach here in early intervention is identifying root cause. And when I say root cause, you're, I want you to immediately think about how am I moving? What's my strength balances look like? How's my flexibility? And how do I do this under load or under stress or under fatigue? Because that's often when we see breakdowns occurring. Very similarly, like we go to, we go to professional sports, a lot of injuries typically happen late in the game because movement patterns tend to break down. They're under fatigue, under strain, and that's when injuries can, can happen. We're no different. We see professional athletes and we think they're on a different pedestal. They're just on a faster, a faster plane of action. In life, we're very similar. We're, this slow breakdown occurs over and over, and so often we get phone calls come in, oh, I have no idea what happened. I just woke up one day and I have this pain. My back started hurting. It's like, okay, well, we have just these little breakdowns over time until finally we get the straw that broke the camel's back, and now we have pain. Ultimately, our, our main goal is to treat it naturally, get relief quick, but also get relief that lasts. And that's um, what we're noticing more and more in our approach to uh, tackling the movement impairments, 
the muscle weaknesses and getting to root, root, root cause issues of back pain is better understanding core strength and why it matters. So today we're going to go over why, what is my core, why does it help prevent and treat low back and hip pain, and then what's the best thing to do now. Simply put, the core is everything from nipples to knees. It is that simple, and it's all the way around both sides. There's a lot of musculature that goes into core strength. Often, when it first came out, everyone thought core meant abs, like six-pack abs. I got to work those to help my back. And that's just like a very, very narrow focus of what core strength actually is. We do work a lot in what's called abdominal bracing. And so it's using our abdominal muscles and, and not just our abs, not just our, our six pack abs, but all of the other abdominal muscles that go into it to help brace, unload and support our spine. So today I want to talk about my, my, my fundamental five. And the first one is your diaphragm. Anyone know what the diaphragm does? Diaphragm is a unique muscle and it is exactly that. It's kind of this cone shape. It's like right under your ribs. So if you can come down and feel the lower angle of your ribs, and if you were to scoop up underneath, that's where your diaphragm is. It'd be at the tip of your fingers if you were to scoop up underneath. So not one that we often massage. We don't really recommend that. You, you can get underneath there. You can do that. Um, and under some circumstances, it's appropriate. Mostly it's not, not necessary. What we find very happens is it's the tool in breathing where when we get into pain, and you probably notice, even if we get anxious, the way that we breathe changes. And the way that we breathe absolutely matters in how our back is being supported or braced. So when we get in pain or get anxious, we use our upper respiratory muscles. We get neck muscles, we get our intercostals, and we'll see our collarbone rise and fall a lot more aggressively. If we're very winded, you'll see athletes, they're breathing in, you see the rib cage really rising and falling. We shouldn't be that way when we're doing our stuff. We should be noticing that. And very, very often, the, the first few exercises that we do is we lay it down and say, okay, we're going to do some diaphragmatic breathing. And they're like, what? Yep, put your hand in your belly and put the other hand on your collarbone. And I want you to breathe and tell me which hand's moving. And so often I'm like, okay, well, both, but I feel my collarbone rising and falling. Okay, perfect. That's how we know that we're doing it wrong. I want you to, to shut down the collarbone movement, and I want you to focus all of the movement on your belly. I want you to feel like you're pushing your belly up. The weight of your hand is, is the resistance. You're not pushing down with your hand. You're just letting it rest on your belly. And as you big inhale, you're thinking, push my belly up and then exhale, let it come out and let it fall down. And do that until it feels very normal to breathe through your belly. Because what this does, this cone shaped muscle, as it contracts, it shortens and collapses and then pushes down all our innards, our guts. And why does that matter? That helps perform or helps form kind of a shelf or a, a cage around our spine because now everything is supported from the front. And that's very important, especially anytime we bend, lift, or twist because how many of you have had back pain and your doc says, don't bend? We have to be able to bend in this world. And we're designed to bend. The spine is designed to do that. We have to do it safely though. And so that's where when we look at these fundamental five, the diaphragm is the one that we start with because, as I'll talk about in a minute, our, these fundamental five work like oarsmen on a rowboat, and diaphragm is a big player in that. The next one is this transverse abdominus. Now, the transverse abdominus, so you can kind of see that but I got these diagrams. This is, this is your diaphragm. Now, I could do a whole talk on the diaphragm and all the attachments that it has across hip flexors down through the spine, all the paraspinal musculature. I've elected to just keep it very simple with the diaphragm and understand diaphragmatic breathing because these other ones are, are also important to talk about. But just know for simplicity's sake, if you go and, and Google diaphragmatic breathing and core strength, you're not going to find the fundamental five on there. There's a whole lot more that goes into what I'm talking about, but I wanted to keep it very simple because the diaphragmatic breathing technique is hugely important. And then this transverse abdominus is this other one right over here. Now the transverse abdominus is like, if we were to put on a, a girdle or a belt, it's fibers that run across the front, not up and down like our abs do, our, our, our six pack abs, they call it the rectus abdominis. It runs across this way. And so you can imagine if we draw that in and tighten it up, what is it gonna do? 
it cinches up all those guts as well. So not only do we have the guts pushed down, but then we have them cinched up underneath. And then from the front, we're very stable. We're braced through our transverse abdominis and we're braced through the top end through our diaphragm. So that helps us abdominally lock or brace our spine, especially when we bend, lift, or twist. And then we have the glutes. Now, glutes, there's three major players in the glutes, we call it gluteus maximus, minimus, and, and medius. Medius is a little bit bigger than minimus for all intents and purposes. But for you just to know, the glutes on the backside, they help stabilize it from the, from the back end. So have you ever seen those construction cranes now there's just huge construction cranes. They come up and at a right angle, they come out and they're able to lift enormous loads. How do they do that and not break? And then we think, how, how can I bend over and pick up a peanut off the floor and hurt my back? When we see these big old cranes out there lifting megatons and not snap. Why is that? Engineering marvel. Well, we are too. The issue is, what do they have, all those big cranes, what do they have on the back end of that crane? A counterweight. It's a huge boom, right? They got this huge counterweight. That is your glute. Your glute is a big counterweight, but even more so, it's a very active counterweight. And we have to be able to engage that and cinch it up to help unload our spine from that bending force to help pull it back. And so often we get mute glutes. And if we try and lift, we do so all through our back causing all kinds of compression. We're loose in the front and we get all kinds of pinching and irritation through the spine. When what we should do is abdominally brace and activate through our glutes and that allows us to rise from a bent position or bend without pain much more effectively. But if there's a sequence to when all those need to fire and how they need to fire to do so safely, that's why we're gonna talk about it. Now your lats, anyone know where the lats are? These red guys right here. Anyone shocked to see the lats a player in their core strength? How are arm muscles a player in core strength? So they do wing across the backside and they come down and insert along that spine. And we're going to talk about some of the features even more so. This one, especially in bending, is widely overlooked. Unless you get really deep into power lifting and like heavy, heavy lifting, they talk a lot about the lats. But we don't hear any of that in terms of core strength or whenever you guys have heard of core strength, we're gonna do core work, whatever workout you're doing, we're gonna do the core. Does anyone talk about lats? It's all about abs, right? Knowing how to activate and when to activate the lats during any kind of forward bend motion is hugely important. And so we'll talk about that. And then the other one is your traps. Trapezius muscles, these ones up the top. Another one that many folks are surprised to hear play a part, especially, especially in bending. Anytime we're lifting a load from the ground, which we all have to do, whether that's shoes, dog food. I now have a pellet smoker that, I mean, those pellet bags are the salt for your water softener. I mean, all these things that we have to be able to lift, either that's gallons of milk in the groceries out of the trunk, all these things that we have to be able to bend over to lift without pain and without hurting ourselves in the future the traps play a big part, and I'll tell you why. The biggest secret and, and undervalued, probably the least spoken of, I'm going to say it, you probably have never heard of it, is this fascia called the thoracolumbar fascia. Anybody heard of this before? Brand new. What is fascia? Anyone have any idea? It is. It's a connective tissue, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, uh, we're, still, we're still learning all about it. We, we, we don't fully grasp how it affects chronic pain, fibromyalgia. We're, we're still learning because we, we, we don't really know how to study it. It's not really, um, it's a unique tissue in that it has rigid, uh, like rigid tissue components capabilities. It's also very flexible and flimsy. Um, we're, we're learning that different fascia in different areas have different purposes. But we're also learning that there are some, um, some radiating patterns that are called fascial patterns versus nerve patterns. We're seeing a difference in how pain or sensation distributes along lines of, of nerve distribution, as well as along lines of fascial distribution. So we're, we're still learning a lot about it. What we, we are noticing is this thoracolumbar fascia has very unique attachments to those fundamental five muscles. 
And when you think about the location of this thoracolumbar fascia, what does it look like? So it's right along the spinal cord. It's right in that low back area. And what does it look like in terms of, of um, any kind of aid or assistance to the core or low back? Do you guys remember? Um, you might be too young, actually. Remember when Home Depot, every Home Depot worker would be walking around with one of those back braces on? Remember that? Why don't they do that? They don't do it anymore. Why is that? Used to be every Home Depot worker is like mandatory. You have to have one of these on. And you'd see them lifting without a buckle, bit, but whatever. The reason why external braces don't work as well as internal braces. And this is your internal Home Depot back brace, the one that actually works. And the reason why is because of its unique attachments to all those muscles that we just talked about. You can see how the lats come down, insert right along this thoracolumbar fascia. Traps come down, insert along the top side of this thoracolumbar fascia. Glutes come down, insert along the bottom side of the thoracolumbar fascia. Transverse abdominis muscle inserts along the side of the thoracolumbar fascia, and the diaphragm inserts along the front. There's, there's multiple layers. Again, we could do a whole other talk about the thoracolumbar fascia. But there's anterior fibers or front portion fibers that attach to the diaphragm. So when all those are contracted, guess what that flexible, kind of elastic thoracolumbar fascia, guess what it does? It's pulled tight like a sheet. And now we have this beautiful internal back brace that's glorious for bending and supporting our back, especially when we use it in the right sequences. So you can imagine if I do bend over, but my head is relaxed and my shoulders are bent, what happens to that thoracolumbar fascia? It's pulled taut. If my shoulders are back and my lats are engaged, my chin is tucked back and down. As I bend forward, it's now rigid and active. What happens so often is my shoulders will roll forward and that actually shuts off my lats. My lats are no longer working. If my head drops down or if I look up, you'll see a lot of folks, they'll look up when they lift from the ground or a bar and that actually causes a yoking mechanism across the shoulders, they get upper back pain. If I keep my chin tucked down, I'm drawing on the fibers all along through my traps to pull this top corner of the thoracolumbar fascia to pull it tight. I draw in and I breathe down through my belly to pull down my diaphragm, activate my abdominal bracing system. And then I'm able to, as I bend through the hips, get my glutes involved. So they're pulling from the, bo the bottom side of that thoracolumbar fascia. All of that works in synergy to pull tight and give us that very active and rigid internal back support and brace. The fascia again, we're noticing it more and more. We, we have this big band, this IT band of fascia, iliotibial track. We're noticing, we, we thought we could massage it and, and like strip it and do all kinds of things to it to help loosen it up if that was the issue. We're noticing, you know what? It's not under any tension until the muscle come involved. So it's a muscular lengthening issue versus a fascial lengthening issue. And so we're noticing we need to be attacking the right structures instead of the wrong ones to get any kind of relief in this thoracolumbar fascia is no different. What we haven't done is exploit the rigid capabilities of this fascia when we activate the core strength and the core musculature in the right order in order to give us that relief and support that we need. So they all work together like a, a row team or a crew team. Diaphragm is your captain. Diaphragm helps to get everyone on the right the right pace. Uh, you've all seen, um, I mean, maybe you haven't seen, uh, I tend to like to watch some of the Olympic um, events, especially the crew team, where they're just like, how do they row in a straight line is my question. They're not even facing that way and they are like straight line to the finish. I don't understand how effective they are. Often you'll see they have a catheter that's facing the other way, the way that they're wanting to go and is able to guide and direct who needs to do what more. Uh, but it's one of the, the, the two, the tandem, and they're just Plowing away, I don't get how they go straight, but whatever, great for them. It's hugely important, though, to have that captain because you'll notice if if one of these guys is not pulling its weight, if one of them's half asleep or was out late the night before, we get huge differences in the production or report of that crew team's ability to go straight or finish on time. Your core is no different. And when muscles aren't active, when – and I say active, let me let me rephrase that because – we can get our muscles to activate. 
like there's no such thing as as muscles being turned on or turned off. It's just a matter of how much recruitment, how much attention we're able to give those muscles and how many of those fibers in the muscle are able to contract. And then how many of those muscle fibers in that muscle are able to contract at the same time? Because I use this crew team analogy very often to describe muscular strength and muscular efficiency. Because similarly, our muscles are made up of several fibers. And those several fibers all individually contract. But just like a crew team, if they're not contracting at the same time, the same rate, for the same purpose, we get muscle weakness. And so a lot of our effort with our folks for the first four weeks is just to improve efficiency, is just to improve leadership of, hey, all you fibers need to be activating. When I say go, you all have to go. And we see that very often, and in, in, it's very difficult to get abdominal bracing, the dry in technique, diaphragmatic breathing where it's like, okay, these still want to play along. Okay, these guys need to shut down. It's all about this diaphragm to breathe. Work through those a few times. Help help cue you in different ways to make sure that those muscles are working the right way. There's a whole lot more into getting those muscles to work and to work together than just contract or not contract. Uh, we, and we, we notice all the time when we get breakdowns to core strength, it changes the way that we walk, it changes the way that we bend, it changes the way that we sleep, we breathe, we twist. All these things play a big part in core strength. Um, so hips, for example, Robin, you had some hip pain. Um, anyone else here have had hip pain in the past? Know someone who has had hip pain? We see a big, big correlation because why is the hip, why do we get this greater trochanteric bursitis or hip bursitis? We hear that so often. And it's almost always because we have some kind of underlying corollary low back issue. And it's one of them is going to give up first. There's a tug of war. And this, in this case, the hip lost faster than the back did. And so now we have hip pain. And so being able to work through how to appropriately address the core strength so that we are getting our hip strength, hip activation, so that one's not wearing out faster than the other. Okay, any questions? That was a great time for it. What did you guys learn today? Wow, that's a question. Um, why is back pain more common like, when people have like desk jobs? Do you think you would have more back pain? Yeah, good question. You would think your more labor type folks would have more back pain than you're sitting. And um, I don't know if it's how, I, I don't know how accurate the assumption is because we do know 80% of the population is going to get back pain and they come from all walks of life. We do notice that there are people who do poorly in a seated job. We do notice there are people who do poorly in a, a, a more of a labor line of work. We do know that, that any activity that we're doing incorrectly repeatedly over time is going to lead to some breakdown of either the spine or the hip. It's really any joint surface, but spine or hip. It could be knees as well. Some of that tissue is going to break down over repeated disuse of that joint. And I say disuse only to try and describe the natural the natural progression that we're all on of decline, of strength going down, and without efforts to counter effect that decline, we're going to be on that same journey. We're going to break down. And so it's, it's a matter of which efforts are we undertaking to combat the natural effects of our physical decline, which are inevitable. I want so. to do a demonstration. <laughs> a demonstration? Yes. So when you're... Okay, so say all these principles, you're doing a deadlift, mm -hmm. you're automatically going to position your body that way to lift something off the ground. Yep. Because those are all the things that you need to do in order to lift that weight off the floor. But your hands are in a certain position, you're, so if you're picking up something smaller off the ground and you're going to naturally want to curve forward because you have this little baby and you got to scoop them up and here you are yep. in that position yep. where you're going to hurt your back. Because so you've all heard lift with, with your knees, right? When you're deadlifting, you're pulling back and you're doing all the things. But when you're picking up something different, you're, so you're already wet naturally. Right. Oh, gee, let me just get this. We can't always, that. we can't always lift with our knees, right? We have to, we have to be able to get in some awkward positions to be able to lift. And that's why the fundamental five are so important. And it's very easy to think um, that it's bad lifting technique because oh, look, I'm seeing him bend down and he's picking that weight up and he didn't even bend his knees. 
we're actually designed to do that. Like that's not an unsafe move. It's unsafe if I'm lazy through my technique and doing it. And so what you probably didn't notice is how I kept my chin tucked. My shoulder blades were already engaged. As I was going down, I'm inhaling through my belly. As I inhale, I grasp the weight. And then I exhale on the way up, but I'm bending all through my glutes versus getting lazy through here and coming down with that weight where if I continue to keep talking or I'm not able to engage completely, I put myself at more risk. Um, but yeah, you're, you're going to lift awkwardly. Kids are a prime example of like, they don't want to get picked up. And now you're trying to pick them up. Uh, I got four boys. I've rushed many up from the ground. And it is one of those where you've, you've got to be able to brace core and activate everything in the right sequence so that you get down. What are some things you guys think about the ground? We see water softener tabs, um, uh, dog food's a big one. I get a lot of folks asking about. What are some things you guys pick up off the ground? Anything different than those? Like, um, Give me simple things. I had my brother. My brother came in one time because he threw his back out getting a peanut M and M off the coffee table. <laughs> Guess what he did all morning? Went on a hike carrying his daughter on his hip the whole time, and then he went to bed and pick up a. A peanut M and M off a coffee table. It's that simple. I, it, there's just little things that go on, and so what could have helped him out? As simple as that peanut M and M. If you're in constant practice or regular practice of breathing in, bracing through the core, shoulder blades down and back to activate the lats, and then we're able to bend through here to pick up whatever we need. Notice it's still very heavy hip hinge. We're going to be okay. Now, obviously, there's no guarantees in life. But when you set yourself up for the most success possible, you typically are able to avoid a lot of risk. Can you do a dramatic example of a hip hinge versus just bending over? One of my favorite exercises that we do in here with the kettlebells, and you can do it with a gallon of milk or a jug of water at home, is we, we kind of over overactivate the boom effect of those big cranes. And my favorite hip hinge exercise, you'll see a lot of us do it in here, is you grab that weight behind you, and I say your first move is to show it to the ground. So you push that down to the ground and guess what that forces my arms to do? They straighten and my shoulder blades go down and back. What's active right now? Traps. traps and lats, mostly lats. My traps will activate once I do this. My traps now are pulled on tight. Now I notice we're not like fully sending out the chin tuck, but we're just setting. We get our, our chin set here. So as I'm pushing the weight down, my shoulder blades are tight. I'm pulling my belly in to get the, the transverse abdominis. I breathe in, my knees stay straight, and I come right back up. With the weight behind you, it's like, where'd all the load go? Like, suddenly, I, this feels like nothing because the, the boom effect is real and we're able to leverage the fact that the weight's back here. Now, why do we do this when all the muscles that we're working seem to be supported by this load to pull us back up? Is because we want to improve graded exposure to those tissues through a bending movement without hurting you. And so when folks are like, no, I'm not going to bend. I've had horrible, every time I bend over, excruciating pain and days of recovery. Got it. Put this on. Let's just have you bend forward half and come right back up. It just graded exposure. Let's get those tissues to be like, hey, wait a minute. We're, we're okay. We can do this. And as we do so, the more application, the more exposure they get, the more they can remodel, reframe, and improve their efficiency to accept load, especially in a bending position. So, so my thing, and I mean, that's a lot of things to remember when you're just going to take I only gave you five. There's only five. <laughs> you're right. It is. Cool. It is. And, and like we want to remember it all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh-huh. So then is your recommendation to like just practice that? One at a time. Natural. One at a time. That's why you'll see a lot of our low back pain folks will start on a table. And I lay you down and I say, all right, I'm going to give you two exercises. And they're both are going to seem really silly for you. Lay down. One hand goes over here, one hand over your belly. And I want you to breathe. That's your first exercise is you breathe. Now, what are you noticing? As you breathe, is your collarbone rising and falling more than your hand? All right, let's work on quieting this down. So take a big, deep breath. I want you to think about pushing your belly through your hand. Push your belly button through your hand to the ceiling. Big, hold it there. Hold your breath right there. And now exhale, exhale all the way down. I want you to push all the air out and let your belly like sink down to your spine. Like you're going to grab your spine with your hand. All right, now let's just do that. 
because you're right. It, it, it's, it takes a little bit of practice and we just do one thing at a time. Because after that, we do the transverse abdominis exercise. Usually I do those two and depending on how that goes, I'll do a bridging exercise in that first day. If folks are not in a lot of pain and they're feeling pretty good and they get these first couple really easy, we progress you quite quickly. But some folks, it's like day three and we're still on breathing. That's okay. Not everyone's ready for the next thing. Nice and slow. Back pain, chronic pain is a whole other animal. And there's a lot of psychological components to everyone's experience with pain. We're noticing that more and more. We, we used to think, oh yeah, we'll tolerate it all to, to delivering a baby. Is it zero, zero to delivering a baby? Where, where are we at on the pain scale? It's just not that simple because what people can experience pain-wise at a one or a two can be a three or a four to someone else or an eight out of 10 to someone else. And so we stop trying to compare your pain scale to my pain scale to her pain scale. It's just your pain scale. And so I have so often I've had folks, but well, I have a high tolerance of pain. So it's, it's probably this for me. It's like, okay, well, let's just get this straight. It's just your pain scale. It's all that matters. We can't correlate tissue damage or tissue injury to your reported pain scale. It just doesn't line up. And pain is, it has emotional drivers. It has, um, memory drivers, uh, there's a, a much deeper dive into, uh, into pain interpretation than just tissue damage. It's, it, they're not, it's not equal. So yeah, as far as remembering everything, you're right. Now there is a quiz on it later on though. So no, there's no quiz. I'm just kidding. All right. So I hear this a lot. I already do all the exercises. We've got folks who come in for a little, for a little back pain and, and like, okay, we're going to give you some exercises. Oh, hold up, hold up. I already do all the exercises. And I'm like, okay, perfect. Perfect. Tell me which ones you're doing. And they'll list off dozens of them. All of them are like abs. Uh, and it's like, okay, how is that working out for you? Oh, I still have back pain. Okay. What if I show you some other ones and we make sure we do them correctly? I get so many folks who will come in thinking that because they do exercises, they don't need physical therapy. And the reality is um, it, couldn't, it couldn't be more untrue because when you start looking at, so the internet's a wonderful thing and YouTube is great. There's a lot of things you can learn on YouTube. What you can't learn is how well you're doing those exercises. And what you also can't learn is if those exercises are right for you and your case and at this moment, because maybe those exercises are right for you, but maybe a month from now, or maybe not ever. But because they're available on YouTube and it says core in the title, well, I'm doing them. So often one of the, com the conversations that we have early in our care is with people to unlearn what they have been doing or what they have been thinking about in core strength to then think, let's just break down the fundamental level and make sure that we're doing them in the right order for the right purposes to ultimately produce the right outcome because it's not just a matter of doing the exercises. I had a lot of folks who come in and say, well, I've tried, I tried PT, it didn't work for me. I understand, I, I totally accept that you've been let down in the past by other physical therapy or the chiropractors or, or massage, whatever the case is, I, I get it. Um, I do things, we do things here very differently. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to have a conversation about what has worked with you, what has not worked with you. And let's find what we can do together to make sure that we give you some success. Because what we do know, and we hear this all the time, is that physical therapy is not the same. It is not created equal everywhere. And every provider has a little bit different take. Every model of care has a little bit different take. We get so many folks who will come in and said, I've never had physical therapy like the way you guys do it in here. But we have Tom in here, current patient. He's been to physical therapy several times for low back pain. He's had an, a, tr a horrendous case of it right now. He's is it two months now he's been with us? Two months now, he's, he, when he first started, could not lay on a table. We were doing everything in a massage chair. Then we moved to the floor and now we have him on a table and he, he finished his back. He was a whole other thing going on, but he's finished his backyard. He's now in a place where he's, he's a lot more stable. He's not out of the woods yet, but because of how long he'd waited and how much he'd done otherwise, he came in into, at a, a very deep hole of, of low back condition. Um, 
but every day he walks out of here, he's very thankful for the way that we do things versus the kinds of physical therapy he's had in the past, which usually looked like 10, 15 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time with the provider. And then you're doing exercises unsupervised the rest of the time that you're in there. And that's just not the way that, that we do it. You're, you're at least 30 minutes to 60 minutes with your provider one-on-one -on -one to make sure everything is being done correctly. And then we work with you accordingly after that because it's, it's just not the same. Um, yeah, so these are some of the common issues that we've had with uh, folks who tried it elsewhere. Good. So this is kind of the next thing is um, what we do with low back pain is if you're absolutely certain people who are suffering with low back pain, we can help you. Each visit with us is direct pay, 195. We also have two other options. I did release an online course. Uh, online course isn't perfect, but it's perfect for some folks who still maybe don't like people, aren't feeling really safe with where they're going, or just want to do it at their own pace and in the safety of their own room. There's six videos on there that will go through everything, and it's uh, really low price right now. And uh, there's a, a QR code on there you can scan. And then the other one is if for any reason you're not certain about what to do next, we do a free discovery session, which is a 30 minutes one-on-one -on -one with one of our providers. Ask all kinds of questions, particularly about your case, and then they'll be able to answer if what we do here is going to be effective for you. Um, and that's what working with us looks like. And all of you have been, except for you. Mm -hmm. But let's keep it that way. It's better that you don't. <laughs> oh, you are? Back pain? Very, very common. You're not alone. In early, you're 25, you said? Most often in early 20s, we get a lot of uh, discogenic type pain, some pinching, some discogenic irritation, which is what the disc is. Um, and they respond very, very well to a stabilizing uh, approach. Good. What other questions do you guys have? What about like positional changes? I get low back pain when I sleep. Yeah, yeah. Or Good question. If you're sitting for a long time and you notice it more, is that still core stuff or? It is. And where we notice it is, so you're talking about static positions. Static versus dynamic. Dynamic meaning moving. Static means that we're sleeping and not moving or sitting for long periods of time. And what ends up happening, there are positions for if you have back pain or are concerned about back pain that you want to avoid when you're sleeping. And there's all kinds of arguments about different providers having different ideas about it. But here's one thing that we do know is laying on your left side, pillow between your knees, one to two pillows to support your head so you're not sacking too deep this way, but you're also not too supported this way with your neck. And then a pillow, or typically a body pillow, or even a decorative pillow to support your arm over top. So your top arm will be hugging a pillow. That's the best. So your knees are bent a bit. You're kind of in a fetal position, kind of. Not full fetal position, but, but kind of. Knees are supported so you don't get any hip strain. And then hugging a pillow so you don't get any upper neck or arm strain. Now that's how we start. Left side because it's easier on the digestive tract. Also easier on our, um, because our heart's on that side, it's, it's less strain on our heart. Um, we, we know we don't wake up the same way that we went to bed. And there's only so much that we can do about that. And I don't recommend straps or I don't recommend that. Okay. But um, you do your best. And so that's typically how we like to have you start. Other positions of comfort for people who are having back pain and those who respond well to a decompression approach, meaning that like a spinal traction type approach, the best way is on your back, one pillow, maybe two at the head, but then three to four down underneath your knees. Your knees are bent. Your legs are elevated a bit. That helps to unload a lot of pressure on the back for those who are have um, a response to a decompression technique. Yeah, Casey. We do have a video on our YouTube that shows all of the sleeping positions we just talked about. Good point. Good point. If you need more of a visual. Good question. Yeah, Nami. Okay, so I'm a PSPN, and we lug a lot of really heavy... Mm -hmm. equipment like straight like the football bleachers mm -hmm. we're always bringing heavy stuff up and down like what's the best way that i should like really go about that because it's literally yeah. like a 20 pound truck full of equipment totally to so, so psbn is a student run um broadcasting network for pure unified school districts and that one goes to sunrise mountain so that when she says psbn that's what she's talking about is this this news this uh AV audiovisual team that you guys are lugging equipment around 
football field, basketball courts, all around campus, wherever that might be. And always, always, when you're carrying heavy loads, get someone to help you out if you can. That's always like the, the number one rule. Number two rule is get yourself in a position that you can sustain for a long period of time. And then number three is always take breaks. You always get injured when you overstrain or think, oh, just a little bit longer. I'll carry it a little bit longer. Build in breaks. How, there's my next break. There's my next break if you're going long distances. Any way you can, you want to use leverage, meaning that if you're pulling something, you still want to stay tight through your core and you're leaning more forward. Still balance, but you're leaning forward. Just the leveraging effect that you're going to have with your body weight uh, is hugely important. I've seen... So when I used to work in inpatient uh, hospital setting, we had a gal smaller than Casey, but it, she was maybe 100 pounds, smaller than Casey, real thin, but she's able to, to lift, we call it max assist, lift our patients off the table, the bed, into a standing position. And how did she do that without hurting herself? Leverage. She was just great at leverage. She would get low, lock the knees, pull from the hips, and she would just lean back and it's like, <laughs> they just stand right up. And we had so many folks, we had a lot of students at the time, strong guys, you know, like me, going in there trying to, to lift these patients off the bed. And she's like, no, she just get in there and she would just pop them right up. And we had folks that couldn't do it very well and they're much stronger. I mean, they would get there, but they're exhausted. Meanwhile, she could do it all day long, but it's leverage. The, I mean, to answer that would take a great deal of specifics and knowing what you're carrying, how far you're having to do it, who's with you. There's a lot of little things to, to be aware of in that case, but always think about mechanical advantage and leverage. Um, but the fundamental five are going to be hugely helpful anytime you're lifting from the ground or overhead. Overhead's another big one. Good question. Good. All right, takeaways. What'd you guys learn? Joni. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, would it be worth doing your the online exercises first and then coming in for good question. Energy. Good question. Um, I think it would be a case by case thing because I can see where it would be beneficial to have a background in those exercises, especially if um, I could see where it'd be helpful. I could also see where we'll, depending on your case, we'll do a lot of those same things in clinic and then we'll have eyes on you and be able to cue you and work through those things. If, I would say if you've been in here before, if you've been in here before and done a lot of our core work with us, I think it'd be a great supplement to have the online thing. If you've never, if you've never done any of this before uh, and feel like this is all brand new to you, I would think that the online, you may want a little more supervision than the online thing. But if it's like, yeah, I kind of get it. I've done some of these before. That sounds very familiar. Or I've been in here before. Or we've done some of these exercises. The online is perfect for you there because it's a, I give a lot of detail. Each video is about 30 to 50 minutes. Um, there's a lot of detail, a lot of discussion on what you're doing and why you're doing it. What's missing is the ability to see you and help you do it. Uh, it takes a lot. It, it's a lot of requirement on you to know what you're feeling. Are you doing it right? Um, and, and that's, we see that's a big obstacle in a lot of folks of like, okay, I'm doing this, but am I doing it? Am I ready? Right is this really the way it's supposed to go? And there's just a lot of help that, Hands on and or otherwise. You know, the other thing is, like, I bought the uh, black party thing. Yeah, yeah. So would I do it? That's the best deal we've ever done. Yeah, it's pretty good. Would I do a discovery visit first? You wouldn't need to, because you just come in for your your first visit, and we go through everything with you, and then get you started with treatment that day. Yeah, because the whole the whole purpose of the discovery is for you to to chat with one of our PTs and say, this is what I've got going on. Is this a thing that you can help with? And then it's it's a back and forth of like, let's get into a little bit more specifics. Let me ask some questions. Do you have some of this stuff going on? Is this what's happening? How do you respond to this kind of thing? It is a way to kind of, okay, I think you're a great candidate for physical therapy. If it's like, nah, I got some this and that, this thing going on. I lose feeling here. I've never had an MRI. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've lost my legs, completely gone numb. I've fallen to the ground. Like we're talking about maybe there's cancer, maybe there's, so spinal cord, it's like, okay, no, you need something else. Um, otherwise, it's it's more for that reason. Good question. Yeah. Good. Takeaways, what did you guys learn? What was something new, something fresh that seemed uh, exciting to you? Worth your time. All of it? 
it's what the down. court actually is. Yeah. Not just what was there. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of folks are still shocked to hear that. Yeah, L. Yeah. We have a really nerdy saying in physical therapy. There's no distal mobility without proximal stability. So a lot of big words, distal, proximal. So distal is far away from, so upper extremities, lower extremities, farther away from midline. There's no distal mobility movement without proximal stability. For example, we've done studies. This is how nerdy we are. What muscle works first when I raise my hand over my head? What do you guys think? Just you can say like arm muscles or leg, whatever. What muscles do you think activate first? Many folks will go arms or, or it's transverse abdominis. It's this one right here. That one fires first before we go overhead. Why? There's no, there's no distal mobility without proximal stability. Yep. In the weight room, your meathead gym guys will say, you can't shoot a cannon out of a canoe. Without, without stability, you can't shoot a cannon. I'm not sure what they're talking about with a cannon, but there's you know, your big, strong, power meathead guys that <laughs> want to throw big weights around. They say that with uh, leg day. You see guys who skip leg day and they're all arms. I skate like that when I was a teenager, and I would always tell them, "Don't do it on your legs." Use your legs. <laughs> <laughs> so cool, yeah. Like, there's, there's a whole other half of the weight room that you're missing out on. You got to go find that. Yeah. Yeah. You get tired. Yeah. No, I, so good, Robin. That's perfect. Yeah. You're, it's it's your abs. It's your transverse abdominis specifically. Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. And what I really like about the whole purpose of that okay. is because one of the one of the things that we try and do with with physical therapy is we totally recognize we are on a journey. Mm -hmm. Recovery is not a destination; it's a point in that of that journey. It's a it's it's one landmark to that to that journey but there's a whole other part of this where we want to live with joy and avoid these kinds of things in the future and it's not as though we can complete care and think that i'm all better and i'm done when the reality is we still need to maintain that because if we don't we lose it no matter what we did if we go, if i go and sit down for the next three months i've just undone everything one of the most i was shocked to hear this when I was in school, we were studying cardiovascular health and very similar to any, our body is very efficient, but they measured how quickly we lose cardiovascular endurance with bed rest. So they would take college age males and females and they're fairly active. They do all kinds of measurements with their VO2 max cardiac output. And then they, they measure it and they say, okay, Go lay in bed, and we're going to measure your cardiac output over certain intervals. Guess how many hours of consecutive bed rest it took for them to get measurable changes to their cardiovascular output? How many, how many days, hours, or weeks do you think it took of just laying in bed? What's your guess? You said several. A couple hours. Great. Thank you. A couple hours. Over and under a couple hours. What do you guys think? Twenty-four hours. You think we sleep for five to ten? I mean, if I'm a teenager, it's fifteen. But so <laughs> five to seven hours a night, typically. Um, but it takes only twenty-four hours of consecutive bed rest to get measurable changes to our cardiovascular output. That's for college. These are for healthy males and females. So imagine for those of us over thirty-five, which is when we start to see what we call sarcopenia sarcopenia is the natural age related changes to our strength our muscle decline 
it's about about half to one percent a year, which is kind of scary. Uh, that's how quickly it can decline if we do nothing. Now we know we can combat that. We don't have to. We, we're not forced to decline at that rate. We can do a lot of things to combat that. The fitness program is exactly what that's for, is so that we can stay on some program, some measure of resistance training and activity to mitigate or to challenge the inevitable decline that we're on. Now, we're not going to test, does the 24-hour thing work for me? No, don't test it. <laughs> Just know that it's it's very much so if we don't do anything, we decline. And the nice thing about the fitness plan is that I think for a lot of people is adherence and accountability is really a big thing. You get busy with every other thing in your life. You think about 100 reasons why, well, I didn't get my home exercises done today, but I'm good. And then before you know it, three months have gone by, and now you're starting to feel worse. Where if you have something that you attend and you go to, mm -hmm. it's almost like your your mindset once you walk through the door is you're ready to do this. this I'm committed. To do. Yeah. I'm committed. And, and you do it versus willy-nilly, whenever, I'm going to go and do it, and then the phone rings or the laundry or the dog or the whatever. You know, it's so easy to just lose track of the thing that you really want to stick with when you don't have any accountability. So I feel like that helps a lot with just keeping people on track and yeah. getting them to follow through with their healthy um, endeavors. So. Absolutely right. It's one of those kind of goes back. Is it, is it Johnny or is it Joni? Joni. It's okay. I was like, maybe it's Johnny. No, <laughs> Joni. Okay, good. Just like what she asked about with the online program is um, it's one of those where it can work great for folks who have been diligent and have a good practice with doing things at home. But like Christy's saying, and, and Christy's speaking from experience because she will just do everything around the house that she can see that needs to get done no matter what she's doing. And if you're like, you know what, I just need to clear the space and get, get to my place of where I'm going to be doing my exercises and be committed to doing it. That's what you need to do, what works best for you. The online program can be great for you if you if you have a good practice around, this is my space for the next 30 to 45 minutes, I'm gonna do my exercises uninterrupted. No one's, I'm, I'm gonna, I don't care if the dishes aren't done, I don't care if dinner needs to get started, I don't care if laundry's not folded, I don't care if I see dust on the floor, I'm not gonna get distracted by any of the other things, I'm gonna be committed to doing the thing. Then I think the online program would be great. I think the fitness program is excellent excellent for folks who want a little bit more than that. The online program is only specific to low back right now. It's just it's just core. The fitness program is going to start with where you are as far as hip and low back. And then we've been able to increase maybe that's shoulder health, a lot of foot and ankle and knee health, a lot of balance and posture health. We do a lot of programs on a month to month basis that we can work in with you to help make sure that everything is being taken care of, not just core. So very good question. Good. What'd you learn? You said everything earlier, but anything. Literally everything. Every... I'm a Catholic, so I don't know any of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Are you sitting a lot at work? Mm -hmm. Is that when you have the most pain? Yeah, I'd say so. But it's not all the time, though. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Just random, pretty bad, taking Advil, and then it goes away after a couple days. How often are those episodes occurring? Um, I used to go to the chiropractor, so it was less, but. Uh, I don't know, like every couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Is it, being a woman, too. Like what's wrong with being a woman? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have the cramps, and then yep. that's where I get all my pain. Yeah. We see that often. Good. Okay. I thought the fascia was very, I didn't know about the fascia doing that job. Doing all those things. So I know a lot of things, but not knowing about that, I was yeah. really new that I had never heard of or read before and that was interesting to see how all those pieces come into play and it kind of reaffirmed to me like when I'm talking to people on the phone for the first time who haven't been here just about how we do try to find the root cause because to me having that fascia work in the way that it does reaffirms that when you come in with back pain we're not just looking at your back we're looking at what are all these other things that could be coming into play with with why your back hurts. And so to me, that was just really interesting based on what I do in the front office, uh, kind of talking people through like maybe the experience they had somewhere else where yeah. I was like, exercises for this and that. And I'm like, but it could be something else that comes into play. And we're really looking at that bigger picture of the body, not just that one part of the body. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's one of those things where um, it's not contractile. Like tendon, tendon connects its muscle to bone. Ligament is bone to bone. What's fascia? Fascia is like everything else. It's skin to, bus to muscle. It's muscle to muscle. It's muscle to bone. It's joint capsule. To, it's, it's kind of everywhere else. And wherever it is, it contains different properties. And in this particular case, the thoracolumbar fascia is kind of a, a unique set of fascial fibers as it is integrated from several muscles. And there's, there's several more I could have included, even from hip flexors and all the paraspinal muscles that also incorporate into that thoracolumbar fascia. But for simplicity's sake, and for folks to give them some success, these are the, the five basic simple ones, easy to cue into and in specific to bending motions, the ones that, to be aware of. So good. All right, awesome. That concludes my talk. I'll stick around if you have any, any in particular questions. If you have anything about scheduling costs or prices or anything, you can talk to Christy. But otherwise, thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. It's been great to get to know you a bit, uh, especially those that have been in here a few times and, and I haven't met you. I haven't met either one of you guys before, but I, I know Carrie. So, uh, and thanks for coming in. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and stream. Yeah.